Dee Nichols. culture. Without culture, there is no humanity. Without humanity, there is no society. Hank Willis Thomas. There is an energy here. Something wants to unearth itself. In the year of 2064, our city will mark its 300th in existence. That year will also be the 50th year since the murder of Michael Brown catapulted us as a region to lay down our burdens, take to the streets, and build our muscles to endure the long work of solidifying racial equity and justice into our systemic, political, and cultural fa fabric. Earlier this week, just three days ago exactly, the St. Louis STL 2039 campaign launched in our city as a groundswell of collective efforts that envision and chart a path toward a future of St. Louis that is more radically centering in its policies around enhancing the life outcomes, voices, and power of its people. Our plans were deemed as fireful as we took up our torches to illuminate a path forward. And during this experience, over 300 more people across the region committed to also set this trail ablaze with us. You see, with a population of a little over 300,000 300, people, these 300 or so people mark about one one hundredth of our population. So that, for me, beckons the question, what does it take for our region to make these visions of a more equitable future reality? And what might compel even more people in our region to be fireful with us? There are some who will tell us that it is in our silence that consciousness can rise. But I refute this. We as a city can no longer afford silence. And for the last few years, we have been all but such. I believe that it is upon us that we own that St. Louis has become a siren. Here on our streets, in our city, we have already rung an alarm that has resounded around the world. And we must not stop this work. We cannot quell what wants to rise. And I believe that what wants to rise in this city is justice, is equity, is connectedness, is regional growth. What wants to rise in this city is the demand that people across our region are not forgotten and disregarded when the promises of our future are considered. What wants to rise is the demand that our central corridor and all of these other areas of development do not become havens for the wealthy to simply indulge in masturbatory shuffling of our city's wealth. What wants to rise are the keys for unlocking equity in every corner, every block, every street, every family in this damn city. Might we challenge ourselves to live in a city where our people can see our potential before they see our struggles? Might we live in a city where people can trust our capacity for brilliance before they question our presence, our presence within spaces? Might we build a sense of belonging for those of us who have for so long been deemed as misfits? I think we can. And to ensure this, I think we must first commit to composing justice as our greatest anthem in this city. To sing the hymns of the people who have marched through our streets and carry their echoes into the rhythms of our works. And should this refrain, it will be the stories and the lyrics of these people that unearth the hidden truths of who we really are. To move towards a more equitable future in city, we must also increase our literacy and power of its workings, of the ways that it narrativizes its stronghold over us. And we must learn how to cultivate it as well as dismantle it. Third, I think we must equip ourselves to 
to rid of our blinders. If we cannot truly see all the parts of this city as spaces of promise, if we cannot truly see all of its citizens as people of promise, we have already failed our future. There is a gaping wound that continues to deepen, widen, and fester the conditions of oppression across our region. And this is especially upon people who are not in close proximity to power in, in our city. We are each infected by our complicity in sustaining its division, the separation of the North to fend for its own, the willingness to allow ivies to dwell on homes that have been vacant for, for decades and years, over sheltering those who are often criminalized for their houselessness. An equitable future cannot welcome us to accept and sustain these conditions. Thus, to heal ourselves for the future, it is upon us to stitch the parts of ourselves that yearn to connect, to disrupt those routes of social navigation that we have committed to memory and to traverse the very spaces they have told us to fear, to ignore, and overlook. In stitching this wound, we will also start to weave a new tapestry of connection and of narratives and of histories that have long been covered and forgotten. So as we seek to make visions of an equitable St. Louis reality, we have to realize that destruction comes parallel with growth and innovation. As we weave and compose new futures, new possibilities, we must choose as a region which parts of ourselves, of our systems, will we destroy in order to usher in the promises that the future might hold. We must decide which parts of ourselves will we untangle from systems of oppression, and which parts of ourselves and our practices must be rendered now obsolete. And in doing this, there's a lot of fear that might come. But I believe that we can muster the courage to not get lost in our fear of loss. I believe that we are a city that is audacious and fearless enough to be a phoenix, to dismantle these parts of ourselves that have reached their time and not see it necessarily as a death, but as a, ba a, a baptism, a regeneration, a rebirth, a revival, a reclamation. In 1764, 300 years ago, we were built as this gateway to usher expansion of this nation. And as we look to the future, I still believe that expansion can be part of our mission. But not necessarily expansion of settlers and colonizers, not expansion of industry alone. I believe that indeed we can lead an expansion of culture makers, of justice seekers, of new age creators. This is our siren. This is our testimony for becoming. We have this moment. And as we act upon this creed, I believe that we can do this and not even flinch. Thank you. So saying this this afternoon, um, the intention was really just to open this up to conversation. You know, at the end of the day, with so many presentations going one way, and I know there are people in the audience uh, whose work resonates uh, with what they just saw on stage. I'm sure that lots of you actually have uh, questions or comments for one another. So we just wanted to give a final space in the festival to conversation. Hi. Um, so, you know, they invited me to do this manifesto thing, and they were like, we want you to do a manifesto, kind of a three to six minute piece, just talking about St. Louis, and I was like, I'm gonna have to, I saw the names on it, it was Michael and Dee, and I was like, oh my god, they, they've done TED Talks. I'm a lip sync artist, I don't even sing on stage, and, you know, it was really cool to be invited here, because, like, I, 
took it in a completely weird, you know, you didn't think that you would have this androgynous, non-binary demon creature stripping at a manifesto reading. If you did think that, then it's good on you. Um, but I, I think that the future of art should be like weird to push boundaries and kind of like, you know, think about the box and like how far out of the box, like how to obliterate the box and get as far from, you know, that central idea but still intact to like create something that resonates with audience members because, you know, Maybe you guys understood what my piece was about, but maybe you didn't. And that like ambiguity of you thinking about it kind of makes it significant, and like it, you can translate that to all of these people. And now you guys have to ask questions. Well, fortunately, I know there's at least one right here. Could could I actually respond to to Maxi? Um, what you just expressed makes me think about uh, Dr. Amber Johnson, who has the the Justice Fleet upstairs. Um, Amber runs the Transfuturism uh, project, and we heard Damon in his video talk a, a little bit about Afrofuturism. And these two vantage points into to looking at our future, I, I think, are so critical. Like, if we in 2018 can can witness like your testimony through performance, and 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 not for me, I don't I don't judge, but like. And people in the audience not judge or flinch or like feel queasy and all of that type of stuff because it's different. Like performance is different. Uh, that I it, it gives me hope that in the future we can all live and express ourselves in the most liberated ways outside of the box, outside of the the confines of what we've been like taught and. I don't know, limit it to, to do. Uh, so I really appreciate every every person in our, our queer community here who takes those those chances. Uh, not not just Maxi, but I, I think about Rosebud. I think about um, a lot of other performers who have come into St. Louis to show us that like we don't have to stick to to simply like spoken word to to show what the future looks like that we can represent that and model it in the ways that we create, so thank you. Yeah, and I think it's in response. I think in response to that as well, it was to I think there are lines in St. Louis that I think quickly need to be erased and blurred as speaking for the future of St. Louis, specifically St. Louis and its art scene. Here, us at RC, we were very important very important for us to uh, put on a performance in which it is enacted by the audience as well as ourselves based upon things and actions that we as a group, as RC, as artists rights to create us as individuals, we participate in these things as a whole. So for that reason, shape, squeeze, and share was quite important to us as well as speaking this manifesto but also putting actions that could become in a way become a manifesto rather than actually speaking, sticking to speech. I think what is important to all of us and artists, um, and particularly RC, is that we, in a way, connect these words to actions. Yes. We're so hipsters. I think they've got a problem. Would you like to ask? Um, well, I, one thing that I noticed about um, the trajectory of this experience was we started, Michael, in a place that was terrifying and doomsday and ended in a place with the of hope. And um, and I was wondering if that was intentional. <laughs> I guess that's really the only question that I had. And one of the other things I noticed was the absence of art and the presence of um, systems and processes which you then, the uh, immediately in, in, in your in your manifesto um, ask us to destroy and um, I guess one of the things that I'm thinking as I'm watching all of these artists and listening to all of these artists is um, how what is the I guess what is the what do you what do you see artists doing to help us um, do that kind of dismantling so that we don't end up with um, more systems and policies and 
things like that in place in 2056 that have St. Charles being never having a, a whatever, uh, a, a, always having a balanced budget and that kind of, yeah, that kind of thing, so. Yeah, I think for the artists, uh, I'll begin to think for the question, but I think as artists, I think there is definite and power in numbers. I think artists like us can all get together uh, for the events of this nature, but also in times in which doors are closed and we're working. I think that is a one way a shift begin because I think for for one, the amount of the, the sheer numbers in which any idea needs to be perpetuated and propelled from the ground up is something that I think the artist needs to uh, consciously consciously think about. I'll just say, I, I almost said it's in a terrifying place because I, I tripped walking up the stairs and then Maxie went on, look what he can do on the stairs. <laughs> I just wear regular shoes. Um, but as to the, the kind of the arc I see and like where I started, as a historian um, and, and theorist, I'm, I'm often really uh, invited to speculate on the present, um, which is a very sort of short horizon. And history, actually, we all know, moves beyond it in both directions. Um, so when Gavin asked me to, to participate, I thought about this sort of timeline as something that could be uh, utopian, it could be dystopian. I actually think it's non-utopian in a lot of ways, if that's a term. It's sort of uh, more sort of a picture of stagnation than of doom and gloom. There's no Westlake landfill mass evacuation. There's no, the city doesn't end. The people who have inherited family wealth today still have it, um, which is, again, stagnation, right? So it's, it's a warning that we're flatlined um, rather than we're going down. Um, and everything in that narrative really, as maybe this does put me in the dystopian tradition, is a comment on 2018, you know, which is situated right in the middle, and that's very deliberate. It's like, I could have spent the next 100 years or the last 100 years. Uh, we've already spent a lot of time in St. Louis, and a lot of scholarship unpacks the last 100 years, and it's great, and there needs to be more of it, because there's some things we don't know, but um, there's not enough discussion on, on sort of envisioning our, our future, uh, and looking at the present moment as a moment of ripe agency, not as like, oh wow, all these terrible things have happened and here we are at the end of it and there's not much we can do as, as a city this small with this many problems. Um, so that's where that's coming from. I had no idea it would end so beautifully with this arc of these, these pieces through all these other sort of interpretive uh, gestures. Uh, one other thing I'll just say is um, the, other, the other part of it is uh, the, there's a philosopher, Paulo, Paulo Verno, who writes about um, the future, the potential is, is not something that's never happened. If it doesn't happen, it still remains a fact. So at all this latent potential where we could go that's wrong is, is in the moment we're living in now. It's a real social fact. So I was hopeful this would be a jar against some of these forces um, and really sort of compel some thinking uh, out of it. Because again, you know, right now if you look at what we're doing in the sort of political narratives we're constructing, they're very flat, they're very static. It's like very short term thinking uh, I think a little too focused on partisan politics when we really know the future of the planet and the sort of metabolism of the city or the larger metapolitical narratives we should be really engaging. Uh, to your first question, did we, did we know? I, I did not know uh, what his presentation was about at all, but I, I think that's a great question for like, the curators, like a great question for Gavin, <laughs> uh, with knowing how, what, what the content of all of our um, pieces would be and lining us up to create that arc. Um, in terms of your second question of what, what is the role of artists or what are the roles of, of artists, I, I think we have that power to, to, make, to make ideas manifest uh, and, and bring that to life right now. Uh, so I, I think one, making art in public uh, with people that actually places um, these notions of our, our future selves into space. Uh, when, I, when I think about an example, I think about um, some recent, or not recent, like some 2015 works from uh, the Artemis STL Collective, where we um, snuck out into West County in the middle of the night and 
repainted all of the uh, street markers that tell cars to like stop at a stop sign. And uh, they said things like stop racism and uh, rise up. Um, and that makes me think of a parallel of uh, parking lots and how we don't always know who might, or actually I think about a, an example from the Pulitzer, I'm just gonna put the Pulitzer on, on blast because when I used to work next door, um, there was a side of a, a sidewalk that uh, people would always park in, in that was right in front of one of the Pulitzer's doors and they painted the side of the salt sidewalk yellow um, and people actually started getting tickets. And so when we think about, well, even in these surface level examples, painting the handicapped sign or painting the yellow stripe in the area actually can influence human behavior, we can amplify that, that notion to uh, thinking about policies and thinking about systems. Can we actually challenge ourselves to reimagine uh, systems of, of food, of education, of um, dealing with crime? Like what? What might happen when artists come together and think about uh, an alternative to policing, as an example, or the dismantling of policing and the replacement of that with something else? Um, I, I think we can model that in, in so many media. Um, so I'll, that's, that's a snippet of like how I would respond to that. Yeah. Any, any other thoughts? Yeah. That was so smart. I don't want to go after that. <laughs> <laughs> also, at, at WashU, um, there used to be a, a policy design lab where there were artists in our class uh, at the School of Social Work and we actually came together to design policy. And uh, there are organizations like the Center for Urban Pop Pedagogy in New York that teaches citizens how to do that through the arts. All of you, this is a wonderful session. Um, I just want to say, not all of you, but a lot of you up there are talking about sort of the powers of art within your communities, right? To um, organize communities, to create community identity, to address problems that community has, to empower communities. And what really strikes me when I see all of you is the, is the diversity up on the stage that you have, so, to use an overused word, that um, you, you know, there's artists from a lot of different places in St. Louis and a lot of different communities. So I wonder if maybe you could talk, as someone who grew up in St. Louis but actually hasn't lived here for a while, I don't really, I'm still trying to figure out what's going on with artists and the art scene in St. Louis. How unusual is this? I mean, are artists in St. Louis also using their powers to cross communities and connect to other ones? Are North St. Louis artists reaching out to South St. Louis artists and vice versa? Or is this unusual, what we're seeing today? My short answer is, no, this is not unusual. I, I also think there are so many dynamic artists sitting in the audience where I would love to hear, I mean, like, of course, hear from all of us, but hear, perhaps hear from some folks as well, because that's such a big question. Uh, one thing I say about RC is that we, uh, we kind of bridge that gap, like, we, we reach out. That's one of the things about you know spreading that love and, and just you know sharing and squeezing and uh, shaking. You know, we stepped out and created these alternative spots that you know uh, the marginalized artists couldn't get into. I'm not going to get into. We created a spot for them to be in, so you know outsiders like everyone else can come and experience. Uh, we started out with Old North St. Louis, and then we moved uh, around because we had a few issues. We went to the south side and did it. Uh, we went downtown to the city and did it. And we're back in Old North. And who knows, we probably go, but we had Webster Groves. So we, we're traveling and we're just taking it with us and just trying to share and bring that to the other communities amongst our people, amongst um, To answer your question, no, I don't think it's unusual. Um, artists have a way of making do with what they have. Um, Aside from being a part of Art C, I am a part of another collective of artists, um, artists in the room who um, are kind of realizing the niche for marginalized artists who aren't really accepted into institutions or don't necessarily feel comfortable in these spaces. So we recognize art education is very important amongst 
for smaller communities. So we've taken that niche and that opportunity to create something that can uplift and can welcome marginalized artists into these spaces. Um, what we do have now going is um, an event, well, a series of events when visiting artists like maybe Nicolene Thomas or, you know, whoever decides to come to St. Louis, we try to get them in a room with a group of people and we try to ask them questions of, aside from the how did you get here, but how can we make do with what we have here in St. Louis? How can we learn from you in other ways? So we, we have that going and I think artists, other artists and other different, you know, communities have a sense of kind of gathering what they have to make do with what they have, you know, in a sense. And just to kind of follow up with what Lola said, uh, one thing I, I always implore people to do is uh, with, with that, a lot of times we want, we want to change and we look at it and say, well, how can we change the world? How can we change the community? And so many times we come across people that say, well, I can't do this or I don't have the power to do this or I'm not connected with this person or I don't have the resources. Uh, a quote that I always keep in my back pocket and I, I keep a lot of quotes in my back pocket so it gets kind of full at times. But is that uh, we, we can do with what, what do with what we have uh, where we are, or do what we can with where we have, with where we are with what we have. I think I, <laughs> so I got kind of tongue tied there. But do use what we have and do with what we can where we are. We don't have to wait to have all of the ducks in a row per se to actually make something happen. Uh, sometimes we, we can change our environment and change how others think just how we interact with each other. And it can be as simple as shaking, it can be as simple as hugging, it can be as simple as sharing your story about how you got to where you are currently. So, um, so I've had the pleasure of working with a lot of these people on this board. Um, I'm working with ICE in two weeks, I work with D, I work with Amanda, with the EPA. And I've been following Michael on Instagram. I just feel like you know people that are creative and that are talented, or me. <laughs> um, we kind of flock together, and we just you know, if you you know you have to look outside of your circle of friends. You have to look outside of the people that you're normally connected with to like grow. Because if you're if you are just hanging out with milkmaids, you're, all you're gonna do is talk about milk. And so you know, as an artist, to be like well rounded and grow as a person, you have to like. Go and meet more people. So I feel like, you know, this isn't weird to see like a whole bunch of artists from different backgrounds coming together. It would be weird if it were just the same type of artist. You know, you had eight drag queens with blonde hair that danced to Katy Perry. That, how, how fun would that be? <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say, I want to give a shout out to the Dwell in Other Futures curators for um, using this platform not only to have us up here talking and sharing and sort of our, our cultural capital, but the curators commissioned us to make work for this festival, which I think is not common enough. I think often myself and others get invited to sit on panels, to talk about work we've done elsewhere, often for free without compensation. Um, but here we were compensated to produce original work as part of the festival, and I think that's really awesome, and I want to see more of that in these large institutional spaces. I just want to go back to the question that you had about um, being a new person, you know, in a city like this, um, just because I'm, I guess I'm the only person um, coming from out of town here, from Newark, New Jersey. And also, you talked about diversity, which is a word that contains a lot of meaning um, and also evades a lot of meanings, right? And so for me, I guess I'll talk about my personal um, journey into Newark as Asian American or brown women of Asian descent who, you know, come up to stages like this and said, you know, Newark being a proud black city has um, fundamentally changed my practice as an architect and urban designer, right? So, um, you know, I talked about it as being at a party and kind of fun and feel good and hang out with people you don't know, you know. But sometimes it's as sort of 
it requires a crazy amount of courage, right? Um, so when I first sort of randomly invited myself to a community meeting um, hosted by um, <clears throat> People's Organization of Power, or POP, in Newark, that was sort of, um, that is now sort of contain, uh, continuing the history of Black Panthers in Newark, you know, as, a, as an Asian woman, you know, how do I get read? And being able to go there and say, okay, well, I'm gonna change my uh, lifestyle change, make a lifestyle change and go to these meetings at least for three months every Thursday and see what that does for you, you know? So, I don't know, I think, I, you, know, you know, I'm, I'm actually you know, like embarrassingly admitting that I'm Brooklynite, you know, like former hipster, sort of making a conscious decision to give up my croissant, and I'm kind of, like after 10 years, I think that that was one of the best things that I did as, a, as, a, as someone who wants, to, who wants to, to see the city the way it is, and so, yeah, here's to moving to a new city and making bold choices. I would also add that St. Louis is such a small city that um, it can feel like it's like a town. And so part of it is just like showing up. And that, you inspired me to say that. Like, I, I know a lot of people in this audience, and it's mainly, like, I can point out the people that I did not meet at an event or a gallery show or someone, another friend's event. Um, because you just start to see some familiar faces the more that you go out and explore. I think the challenge as someone who's like kind of socially awkward is like actually making the connection. I, I think about Lola, like I've known who, who Lola is for a long time, but it took me like months to say hello. And like, I, I think courage is part of that, but like showing up, being present um, is another part and figuring out, you know, where are not only the, the popular things that are happening in museums and um, institutional spaces, but what are those um, underground things? What are those uh, more niche areas as well and explore? Did you want to? I was, I was gonna, can I, can I just ask? Yeah, this may have to be the last one. And it's just a small thing, but um, I think I don't know, there's still a lot more St. Louis that I don't know, and it's, it's I guess, you know, the county. <laughs> um, and there's art happening there, you know, and, and I just, you know, a lot of the time I'm afraid to go. Um, so I, I feel like there probably are some other spaces um, that people are not connecting. Um, and so I would, you know, I'll, I'll lean on the crew and say, okay, well, where, where, where to start? I, I just, I wanted to bring that up because I feel like there's a lot popping and a lot of cross fertilization in the city, yeah. but I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, y'all can tell That's me. the region at large. Yeah. That's so real. There was a drag show in St. Charles last night. Hey. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so mine's actually just a response to your question. Um, St. Louis has a lot of art collectives and they do a lot of work with people all throughout the city. Uh, for example, I'm part of Yale Art Collective. I'd like to represent them just talking. And uh, they work with the Thomas Dunn Learning Center down on the south side to really like do a lot of good uh, artistic work, work in the community, and the best part about it is that you don't have to be an artist to volunteer with them. So uh, with that in mind, actually I, I do have a question now, which is do you guys have any place to start, um, like any collective or uh, monthly meeting that you guys go to? That would be, in, that would be great to get into the yard for anybody I'm trying to. I co-host a monthly uh, dinner party called Food Spark with uh, Sophie Littman, who is also um, a part of the Pulitzer team. And recently we, we switched to like theme-based series, but for a long time, every month, we would pop up in a different area in the city or someone's home and just have conversations about um, things that people care about over food. And um, that has been, become a space for uh, cultivating new connections as well as ideas. Yeah, she must plugs. All right, so I'm gonna plug everything. All the plugs. <laughs> it's like Hans Weinle over here. Uh, so uh, I host a quarterly event called Court, and we showcase queer artists of uh, multidisciplinary arts. We have you know, sculptors, we have 
visual painters, we had musicians, we had speakers, we had videographers, drag queen, burlesque dancers, ballet dancers, people who pierced themselves on stage. Um, and that's what I do quarterly. And then I have a bi-weekly event that I have. It's a safe space for queer people to work on the art of drag. It's called the Drag Lab, and it's kind of just like a choose your own adventure and like a place to like, if you want to designate time to rhyme some of those shoes that have been sitting in your closet forever, if you want to like work on a gown or do character development or practice with your makeup, it's just there, you know, just, I feel like having places like that for people who are starting to do any type of art is important. And I feel like, you know, I, I'm not the, I'm not the number one supporter for like institutionalized education. You know, I feel, you know, college is great for some people, but there's a lot of people out there that they can't afford it or they're not motivated enough to go to a four-year curriculum. And so they need something easily accessible to get involved and discover their interest. 